whose stunning panoramas and memorable score mysteriously belied the savagery of its content. Cannibal Holocaust falls into the category of a movie that's so low budget you kind of believe it's real. And then you look at the people they use, and they use real cannibals and like jungle savages when they film this. You think, what monster made this movie? The courts accused me of really killing and torturing people. A court wanted to see the film with me, so they took me to a special room. Immediately from the judge's reaction, because he grimaced every time he saw a shocking scene, I could see that I would be convicted. The film opened in Italy on the 8th of February 1980 and caused uproar. It appeared to show documentary footage where people were beheaded, castrated and eaten by cannibals. It resulted in it being banned in Italy and Britain. Four youngsters who never came back. But let's have a look at them at the beginning of their incredible... The movie centers on four documentary makers who disappear in the South American jungle whilst filming a study of local cannibals. Then their footage and bodies are found by a shocked rescue party. The shaky camera work and haphazard direction exactly mirror the kind of footage an observational documentary team would shoot. One of the most controversial moments in the film is when the crew discover the impaling of one of the cannibals. And I have watched the scene over and over with a girl impaled on a pole, and we thought that has to be real. Like, of course they took a dead body and just shoved a pole on it. It's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's horrible. That scene is one of the grossest images ever, you know, recorded for any film. It was pretty uh, unpleasant and nasty, but it, it was a powerful moment. When the film made its way to the UK in the early 80s, the lack of video licensing laws meant it was freely circulated, and many thought a genuine snuff movie had finally surfaced. There was a policeman who, who publicly said he'd seen a snuff movie, and it was called Cannibal Holocaust. And that was part of what caused the sort of uh, uh, moral panic about video Nazis, was this, this view that children could get access to this material and there was nothing in law to stop them. The director of public prosecutions responded to the resulting public outcry by banning the film. The DPP set up a list of videos which were approved for prosecution and that became known as the, the Video Nasty List. Um, and and that, that persisted until 1984 when the Video Recordings Act established regulation of all videos in the UK. Blurring the line between fact and fiction had serious consequences for the director when the Italian authorities put him on trial for the murder of the actors. I originally had a contract with the actors where they were asked to disappear for a year. But when I was in court on murder charges and things were going really badly, I had to bring one of them back to testify. Diodato was pretty much a genius at Try, the way he tried to fool the audience with the camera running out of film and stuff like that. They, you know, he was very clever. As unpleasant as the film is and as, as crude as it is, you know, he does have a, a pretty good grip of the cinematic technique. By appropriating the techniques of the documentary world, Diodato had skillfully persuaded audiences into thinking they were watching real, uncut scenes. This is especially true of the last footage, shot by the documentary crew, in which they capture their own murders. You look at the people they use, and they use real cannibals and like jungle savages when they film this. How do you direct a bunch of cannibals in Colombia, in the jungle? How do you do that? Just that alone seemed to me like, I, I, it was just, it just felt like some of it had to be real. 
there's no laws. No one's watching them. You just, you, it just gives you this really creepy feeling. To avoid jail, the director even had to reveal the secret behind the famous impaling scene, which had duped many into believing it was real. Like what crew member could say, hey, I'm gonna stick a pole up your ass, it's gonna come out your mouth, and you're gonna sit there naked for a minute on camera covered in mud. Like, who would allow themselves to do that? And she doesn't move. You don't see her blink, you don't see anything. I just don't know how they did that shot. <laughs> Special effects gave me a pole with a bicycle seat on it. The pole was put into the ground. The girl sat on the seat and she had a rod of light balsa wood in her mouth. Then everything was covered in blood to hide the seat. The way they faked that scene and other scenes in the movie uh, were you know, something that Hollywood special effects guys probably couldn't duplicate with millions of dollars. The outcry caused by cannibal holocaust and the public's belief in a real trade in snuff compelled the police to investigate. Throughout the 80s, it was Michael Haynes' job as head of the obscene publications department to uncover the truth. We dealt with the most extreme end of, if you like, the market, the porn market. So we were constantly seeing terrible scenes of sadomasochism and there was always a suggestion that in amongst all this we would find a snuff movie and so we're always aware you know and alive to that possibility. Haynes's inquiries uncovered the flower of flesh and blood a film thought by many to be the first example of real snuff. It follows a sadistic samurai as he butchers a young woman in his secret lair. Made for the gore-hungry Japanese market in 1985, it was not only promoted as a snuff film, but its brutality suggested it to be one. Here he comes. Watching uh, a, ch a Japanese warrior who is cutting off the hand of a woman, or what appears to be um, very unpleasant, um, unpleasant in the extreme. The flower of flesh and blood not only found its way to Scotland Yard, but it also made it to LA, where a Hollywood actor saw it and was convinced it was a real snuff film. The gentleman who was writing for Fangoria at the time, he used to get all these extreme movies, including this guinea pig film from Japan, and he turned some friends on to it, who showed it to Charlie Sheen, who he was working with at the time. Charlie Sheen uh, thought the film was real and went to the FBI with it. The film is so anatomically accurate that it's almost impossible to tell if it's real or not. This realism extends to the clinical method of dissection, complete with gruesome sound effects. When I hear that this celebrity looked at a film and said that it was the real thing, that causes me to become more skeptical about the allegation. So a lot of times what they're reporting is the myth and the legend of the snuff film, and they dramatize that, exaggerate and embellish it. The flower of flesh and blood was discovered to be a sophisticated fake, but it remains one of the most convincing in the history of snuff. It's extremely, um, extremely nasty. I'm looking at uh, the dismembered head of uh, the young girl, and the Japanese man who did that is now licking the blood off her face. Gross. The film caused such a stir in Japan that in 1986, using behind-the-scenes footage, the making of Guinea Pig was released to show how they created the incredibly realistic special effects. The body parts mutilated